to all three Gautam Yaga. So a formal good morning once again. Uh, a good morning to all of you students here. I'm uh, rather tired of hearing me say good morning. All right. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So we were looking at first things yesterday. And um, um, maybe we should actually do this like a first things and second things session. Because there are some things in first things which we could still touch upon. But let us see. We will try to focus on uh, second things passages to some extent. Uh, but then if we have time at all, maybe we could also take a brief look at some of the first things, things which we could not cover yesterday. Uh, so I thought maybe we could begin today by uh, looking first at this divided kingdom, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And in fact, if you were to look in your textbook, uh, you have a table which makes a comparison between the two kingdoms. So maybe we could start off by looking at that. Uh, you will notice that the southern kingdom has only two tribes, and the northern kingdom has about 10 tribes. And uh, another important fact that we would probably have to note down is that um, in the northern kingdom, you have 19 uh, evil kings, and uh, the southern kingdom has got eight good kings. Okay, so that's another important fact. Uh, because you will observe in the northern kingdom, there's, there isn't even one good god being kicked. Every single king in the northern kingdom made a choice not to follow the Lord. They all work into idolatry. But at least in the southern kingdom, you have eight kings who followed Yahweh and uh, you know, uh, they did not participate in idol worship. And another important thing that you would need to know from your table uh, is at least the capital city of each of these two. So some Bible students do not seem to know this, and it is a basic fact. So, Northern Kingdom, you would need to know what was the capital. It was mainly Samaria. Okay, Samaria, for most of the time that the Northern Kingdom existed, Samaria was the capital. And in the Southern Kingdom, Jerusalem was always the capital. And the other very, very basic fact which every Bible student should know is that. When the northern kingdom finally came under the judgment of God, who of course the kingdom which came, which was the nation which came and captured them, it was the Assyrians. It's the Assyrians who captured the people of the northern kingdom and took them away as uh, you know, slaves. And the southern kingdom, who was the, which was the nation that God used to punish the southern kingdom, it was the Babylonians. So these are all very, very basic facts which anyone who says that they are the believer and they know their bible they should know this in northern kingdom the capital s what and who took away the southern kingdom as capitals okay so these are some basic facts that we need to keep in mind um all right uh, just to take a brief look at second thing some intro regarding that uh, main characters would be Elijah and Elisha. We see uh, many uh, stories mentioned regarding these two prophets. Um, you have Naaman being mentioned here. We have the Shunammite woman. Uh, we get to know about how Jezebel dies. That is mentioned here. Uh, we get to um, read about Hezekiah and Manasseh. Manasseh, the man who repented. Um, these are all Josiah, of course, a very, very important thing who brings about a great revival, spiritual revival. All of these would be some of the main personalities in Second Kings. Um, in Second Kings, uh, maybe we could divide the structure into two main parts. So, chapters 1 to 70 uh, is where we have uh, a description of the north, of both the southern and northern together their history their rulers and then the latter part 18 to 25 only the southern kingdom so chapters 1 to 17 is about both the northern and southern kingdoms up to the time when the Assyrians come and they invade northern um, Israel and they, the last king is Hoshia someone named Hoshia and they are all taken into captivity and so then chapters 18 to 25 only talk about the southern kingdom. 
we'll be touching the details about these two kingdoms even as we do the prophetic books because the property in the prophetic books the prophets are prophesying to the northern kingdom initially and then later on to the southern kingdom so we will be touching upon certain aspects even as we are doing the prophetic books so um, coming to second kings and some of the main things that maybe we could look at uh, one interesting uh, story which most people are familiar with would be in second kings chapter four and five where you have a story of now um, and um, i think it is in second kings chapter four isn't it if someone could confirm um, i think it's the story begins in chapter four it's only in five no no not in four okay fine fine chapter five and four um we get to know that this person uh Naaman, he is from um, you know syria he is part of the assyrian kingdom what did we talk about just now we said who are the people who are going to be capturing the northern kingdom it's going to be the assyrians who would so they were a very powerful people at that time they were also a very evil nation at that time they were invading all the countries which were around their territory and uh, they would take away the wealth they would take away people uh, as slaves so there was a lot of violence which the Assyrians were unleashing and this man Naaman is described as a uh, commander of the army so he would not have been a very well-liked person because he, they, uh, the, the Assyrians also made attacks on Israelite territory so when the attacks were being made on Israelite territory um, most probably Naaman also would have been a part of that so he, he was not coming to Israel as a friend, he was coming there as an uh, enemy warrior. So you see, things are not really very good. So when this um, person was living in Naaman's home as his slave, when that girl, she speaks up for him and says, you know, your leprosy can be healed if you go uh, to the Lord of Israel, he can you know, heal you. When she makes this, when she talks about the prophet who can uh, heal you. Uh, she's actually doing something kind for this man. He is somebody who is opposed to Israel. He can be considered an enemy of Israel. But this girl, in the goodness of her heart, she suggests and says, you know, if you go over there, the prophet who lives over there, he can help you. And so uh, that's basically how Naaman comes over here. And even though he is technically an enemy, the Lord shows mercy to him. Okay, so um, we are all very familiar with this story, so we will not get into the details of all of that. Uh, but after Naaman is healed, after he is completely well, uh, he says in Second Kings chapter five, verses fifteen to eighteen, um, if someone could read out those verses, what exactly is described in those verses? Second Kings chapter five, verses fifteen to eighteen. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we don't need to read those details. But the point being made over here is Naman requests and says, uh, I would like a cart load full of uh, mud from Israel. So why do he ask for mud from Israel? In what way is it special? Uh, mud anywhere is mud. So what is the point that he is trying to make? 
and then they all, in those verses Naaman explains, he says now onwards because Yahweh has healed me, because Yahweh has proved that he is the living God, now onwards I want to offer my sacrifices only to Yahweh. And so he says, frankly, give me uh, a load of mud, which I want to take from here, because he seems to be a little aware of the um, Israelite scriptures, because he seems to be knowing what is said in Exodus chapter 20, verse 24, where it explains what kind of an altar the people are supposed to build, what kind of an altar they're supposed to use to make their sacrifices. So, in fact, if someone could read out for us Exodus chapter 20, verse 24, you will see some specifications made over there. And I have a very good show made for me, and you should sacrifice on the table for the expensive songs. The key that you're offering, and every place where the Lord for me, I will come to you now. No, it says here, the Lord is making this promise. He says, wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. So, Naaman is saying, I want to take the earth, the mud which is from here, and I want to build a temple, an altar to the Lord, and I will offer sacrifices only upon that altar, according to the command and instructions that he has given. When I do that, and when I honor him in that way, then he will come and he will bless me and my home. So here you have Naaman making a personal commitment to Yahweh, and he says one thing, he says, when I go uh, back home and I have to serve my king, my master. So when my king goes into the temple uh, of the pagan gods over there and he bows down in front of those gods because I am holding him and I am supporting him, I will have to bow down. But in my heart, I am going to be committed to Yahweh because I will only be making sacrifices from now on to Yahweh. So he makes his commitment very clear. So we see over here that God chooses to show his mercy to an enemy of Israel, someone who is, um, um, who is who probably would not be considered a friend in any sense of the word. So to the Lord, it really doesn't matter on which side of the battle you are. You know, when, it, when, uh, when they had the world wars going on, uh, the, the, the German no, believers would say, no, no, the Lord is on our side. On the other hand, you could have the, the British army saying, no, no, the Lord is on our side. The Lord is on everyone's side. He's on the side of the people whose hearts are willing to open and listen to him. So all he's mainly looking for is the repentance. Is the person willing to admit what they are, who they are, and you know, be willing to change? in submission to the Lord. So he is on their side. So uh, over here, even though Naaman is the pagan, and in fact part of an army which was making uh, attacks on Israel, when he chooses to finally humble himself, and at first he is very reluctant, he doesn't even want to follow the instructions which are being given. But once he realizes that this is truly the true God, he submits to him, uh, the Lord, and he makes his commitment. And so we see some uh, small examples like this throughout the Old Testament where Gentiles choose to make a commitment to Yahweh. And every time God is more than open and willing to receive them into his family. So the Lord was never against the Gentiles. He was just looking for Gentiles who would be willing to submit to him. And we see a beautiful example of that here in the case of Naaman. One interesting thing that we see in the Naaman story is that uh, when uh, Naaman is asked to go and wash himself, you know, in the water in the river, uh, the prophet does not accompany him. The prophet does not go along with him. The, uh, the you know, Elijah is making it very, very clear that the healing is not coming from him. It's going to come directly from God because uh, Elijah wants. Naaman to trust the Lord, to place his faith in the Lord. So he says, no, you go, you go to the river, you go wash. The, and we see very clearly over there, the prophet does not go along with him. So Naaman gets a very clear picture of who is the healer, who is the living God. And so he chooses to make a commitment to Yahweh. So we see this uh, interesting example of a Gentile being added to the kingdom of God. 
and uh, just to talk very really briefly about Elijah and Elisha. Uh, again, you have you have the table in your textbook. Um, just a minute. There's no problem with the sound there. Um, yeah. In your textbook, it talks about how Elijah is a type of John the Baptist, and uh, I think it's all there. It's all there. Um, and Elisha is described as a type of Jesus Christ. Um, now, why do you think Elijah is being called? Uh, type of John the Baptist. Is there any verse in the Old Testament where it says, um, or in the New Testament in which says that these two names are connected? Why would they think of Elijah? Why not Elisha? Why not say that Elisha is a type of John the Baptist? Why specifically Elijah is being compared to John the Baptist? Any verses that come to your mind? Yeah, so he, uh, John the Baptist asks people to repent of their sins and they, they ask him, the people ask him, are you the Elijah that we are supposed to be expecting? Why, why do they go and compare him to Elijah? How did that comparison even enter their mind? Why didn't they ask him about Elisha? Why did they not compare him with Elisha? Why was John the Baptist always considered, you know, a type of, um, uh, of Elijah? Or rather, Elijah is a type of John the Baptist. Malachi 4, 5 to 6. If we could have one person read out, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Yes. Of the green and written day of the world, and he will turn the hearts of all the school children and hearts to children of fathers, lest I come and start to make a place. Yeah, and uh, one of the online students has actually put that. Yes, it's uh, some of the students have responded. So, yes, it's uh, based on this. So, they were expecting an Elijah who would come and he would bring about restoration. And in the time of John the Baptist, we see a lot of spiritual revival taking place. Uh, John the Baptist was not coming to their towns and villages and doing his preaching. He was out there in the desert. But the people were so eager, they would go all the way over there to listen to his words. And John the Baptist was not doing miracles. He was not doing healings. He was only preaching repentance and restoration. And people were going all the way over there to listen to him. So there was actual spiritual revival going on and restoration was taking place. It talks about different categories of people who were going to John the Baptist. It says soldiers also went to him. And the soldiers were, were convicted of their sin and said, what should we do now? And then John the Baptist tells them what they should do. So um, when people saw John the Baptist operating in this manner and bringing about restoration and change in people's hearts, then they began to think that maybe he is the prophet Elijah who has been promised, who is going to come one day. Uh, so that is why uh, John the Baptist and Elijah are compared. On the other hand, they tend to compare Elisha with Jesus Christ. Uh, now, uh, I'm not very clear on why they bring about this comparison. They make a lot of superficial comparisons, which I don't think are really very valid. But the two main things that I can uh, observe is that both of them, both Elisha and Jesus Christ were involved in healing the sick, um, in uh, healing, uh, cleansing from leprosy and things like that. So maybe because of that, um, they compare Elisha with Jesus Christ. But the comparison between Elisha and John the Baptist is quite clear. Yeah, it's quite self-explanatory. Um, in your table, it also talks about how both Elijah and John the Baptist were out in the desert, away from the people. The people went to, to them. On the other hand, Elijah and Jesus Christ were very much with the people in their towns, in their lives. And um, 
uh, one very important thing that we see regarding Elijah, because uh, yeah, he's the one who deals with Ahab. Elijah is the main person who goes to Ahab again and again and brings the word of the Lord to him. Uh, so it says here, there's two worship of Jehovah in the dark days of Ahab. Um, Elisha is described as the one who is weeping over the evils of the nation. Um, and, uh, one of the greatest things that we see, you know, we identify Elijah with this, of course, uh, the contest which is there between the prophets of Baal and, uh, and him at Mount Carmel, where he's able to prove to his prophets that Yahweh is the living God. Um, and Elisha is supposed to make another game for um, One thing that we see in Elijah and Elisha's uh, story uh, is this incident where they multiplied uh, either food or oil, and uh, also both of them could raise a person from the dead. Um, that would be from First Kings chapter seventeen. Verses 21 and 22, where you have Elijah, who goes to the widow, and uh, right from the beginning of Verses chapter 17, we see Elijah going to the widow of Zarephath, and uh, she says that she does not have any you know, uh, flour left over to make it. Uh, bread and he says it's all right, make it. And, uh, and he says the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry. And uh, so there's a miracle where um, it says in verse 16, verse Kings chapter 17, verse 16, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. And then later on, the widow of Zarephath, her son dies, and when he dies, it is Elijah who is raises him back to life. That would be in verses 19 and 20, uh, where he carries uh, the child to the upper room, where he is staying, and he lies down on top of the child and uh, is able to breathe life into him. So. Um, And then we have something very similar in Second Kings chapter 4, where again you have uh, one of the prophets of Elisha, uh, he passes away, and so his widow is left without any financial help, and then uh, the predators want to take uh, her sons away as slaves. So she comes to Elisha for help, that would be Second Kings chapter 4. And again over there, he says that the Lord will multiply the oil, and the oil is multiplied, they're able to sell that oil and they're able to, uh, to regain themselves uh, uh, their financial, they're able to restore themselves financially. So we see a similar multiplication happening even in the uh, Elisha's case. And Elisha also has one experience where he raises a person from the dead. Uh, again, that's also in you know, chapter 4 itself where he visits a Shonomite woman's home and uh, she's a godly person and she says in verse 10, let's make a small room on the roof and uh, you know, so that you can come and stay over there whenever he's traveling in this direction. And Elisha makes a promise to her saying that one day she will bear a child and she's able to do that and the child falls sick. So when the child falls sick and dies, uh, now with this uh, she who comes to to Elisha and he is able to bring the child back to life. So we see a parallel between Elisha's life and Elijah's life. Okay, so those are some comparisons that we see. Uh, what else can we focus on in Second Kings? Mm -hmm. We have of course the story of Hezekiah and uh, where you have Senna Sherib coming and you know threatening the kingdom. And Hezekiah says, Lord, you, know, uh, uh, you are our help. You know, we cannot do this on our own, but you are our help and we are looking to you. And then you have the help of actress deliverance. These are just some of the stories of deliverance that we see in Second Kings. Mm, any, any, anyone has any questions to ask? Because otherwise, maybe we can actually look in greater detail 
and the story of Hezekiah and Samash. Anyone? So, Pastor John Harvest was the was a promise that yeah, because he would only prepare the way. He was not the Messiah. He would only prepare the way for the Messiah. Yes. Um, So uh, we are in Kuno. Second Kings chapter 19 is where you have Senna Sheran coming and making his threat. And uh, if someone can read our Mahara, some of you are familiar, of course, with this story, but then we know if we can look at seven specific verses. Um, Second Kings chapter 19. And if we can look at verse um, 11 and 12, where you have Sanashir, uh, you know, the, the commander of Sanashir making his threat, verses 11, 12, and 13. Okay, so um, he gives a list of kings. Uh, you know, it's the commander of the army, the, the Rab Shake. That's the title which is given to the commander of the uh, army, the Assyrian army. And uh, he says, you know, these are all the enemies that we have defeated so far. So he says, in what way do you think? That you can do better. How do you think you can escape? And then you have Hezekiah's very famous prayer. So in you know, Second Kings chapter ninety, verse seventeen, is where uh, Hezekiah is praying to the Lord, and this is what he says. So verses seventeen and eighteen, if you can now, uh, seventeen to nineteen, if you could read out, please. <laughs> But they were not gods, for they worked in the next times, within strength. Therefore they destroyed. Now the Lord of God has been the from the time, but all the commands of the earth that you have been worked on the work of So over here, Hezekiah and he says, Lord, let all the kingdoms know who you are, that you are the only true God, and that you are you know, victorious. And uh, so um, this is the Lord's reply. The Lord replies in verses. Um, 32 onwards and uh, in verse 34 the Lord says for I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant to save it and then you have uh, the miracle which the Lord unleashes you know in verses 35 to 37 where you have uh, the angel of the Lord who comes and strikes down the huge enemy camp which is you know, camped outside ready to fight and uh, so they're all uh, found dead and they're unable to uh, fight. So uh, God delivers and proves to all the nations that he is the real and true God. And then after that, we see uh, Hezekiah making a mistake. You know, he falls sick and God makes him well. And then after he gets well, uh, he tries to be friendly with the Babylonians. He does not realize that one day it's these Babylonians who will come and you know, uh, take away his people as captives. And so uh, he makes a mistake. Uh, he allows the overconfidence which has set in, you know, the victories that God has given, he allows that to um, make him lose his uh, you know, vision. His goal had always been to please the Lord, to honor the Lord. But then over here we see that he does not consult with God you know, before he interacts with those Babylonians. And as a result, he brings uh, you know, harm and destruction upon his nation. 
So uh, one lesson that we can learn from this is that when we see God doing great and mighty miracles on our behalf, when we see uh, God bringing victories, we could, you know, stop asking Him, consulting Him, depending on Him as much as we did earlier. Because when we see that the battle was uh, was first supposed to take place, He was so afraid. He said, Lord, you alone can help us now. You know, we're looking for you. And he talks about all of that. But then later, it looks like he's now his dependence is not as strong as it was earlier. So we see that when the envoys come from Babylon, he invites them and he shows them all the treasures which are there in the temple. So if he had consulted with the Lord, then the Lord would have you know, uh, prevented him from doing this mistake. So we see that overconfidence uh, can uh, can cause us to stop being dependent on the Lord. And we see that in ministry, where in the early stages, we are so uh, in tune with the Holy Spirit. We are so guided by Him. But once the ministry grows, uh, once we feel that now we have acquired the skills required to be able to serve people and help people, we start thinking, oh, we can do this on our own. So there's a risk. And we need to watch out for this. Um, coming back to uh, another incident that would be uh, Manasseh. Now, over here in our uh, second case, we don't have much, many details about Manasseh's uh, last days. But then if you go to Chronicles, we see that Manasseh actually repents okay, of his uh, sinful condition. Um, not able to identify the passage. Anyone online or anyone here in the class, so if you can identify the passage which talks about Manasseh's repentance. Yeah, I'm not able to get the actual passage because. Okay, the comparison that I wanted to bring up is that when you look at the last part of the first Kings, where it talks about Ahab's repentance, okay, and we see a contrast between Ahab's repentance and the repentance of Manasseh. That's the point which I actually wanted to make. Um, in first Kings, if we can go to chapter 21, and if you look at the last portion of first Kings chapter 21. Uh, verses 27 to 29. If someone could read out. Okay, so over here, when uh, God pronounces his judgment against Ahab, uh, Ahab is uh, very shocked by what the Lord says, and he puts on sackcloth and fasts, and he repents. So Ahab, the evil king, repents, and later on, even in the story of Manasseh, we see Manasseh. Uh, repenting. This Yeah, uh, we have uh, Manasseh's story in Second Chronicles chapter 33. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this is the passage also. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 33 
and we have uh, verse 10 onwards, which talks about Manasseh's repentance. Uh, if we could maybe read out verses 10 to 13. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his, and his people, but they would know the reason. Therefore, the Lord put on them that the fields of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with him, found him with bronze feathers and carried him off to Babylon. Now, when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord with God and humbled himself greatly before the God his father. Yes. And prayed to him, and he immediately cleared his application and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So we see Ahab, the evil king, repenting and turning back to God. And we see also Manasseh repenting and turning back to God. In fact, Manasseh is described as one of the most evil kings. Okay, so uh, even he repents and he turns to God. What do you think is the contrast between these two people? Who would you say had a genuine repentance? Would it be Ahab or would you say Manasseh is the one who truly repented? Uh, if you look at Manasseh's life, after he repents, these are some of the deeds which he does. Okay, once he comes back, uh, it says in verse 15, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 15, he took away the foreign gods and the idols of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord. He brings about many changes. He shows the fruits of a repentant life. He actually demonstrates actions of a repentant life. On the other hand, when we look in uh, first Kings at Ahab's repentance in uh, you know, chapter 21, first Kings chapter 21, verses 27 to 29, he repents and he's very, very sorry for the judgment which the Lord says he will bring upon him. But in the very next chapter, you see him going back to his home base. So one very important lesson that we can learn is that repentance shows up in the actions which we perform. So just saying that you're very sorry is not enough. It has to be demonstrated by the future actions. That shows whether there was actually repentance took place in the heart or not. And just to use a New Testament example, when the Pharisees come to uh, John the Baptist for baptism, he says, who asked you to come? Because you, are, you, know, you have not shown any signs of repentance, is what he says. So he says, who told you to come over here for, for baptism? Because you are not showing the fruit of repentance. So we, we have two evil kids, uh, both of them repenting. And what we see is a true case because his future actions demonstrate that he has indeed turned back to the Lord. On the other hand, in Ahab's case, it's just a temporary uh, repentance, more because he's feeling sorry for himself that God is going to bring judgment and not because he really wants to change his ways. Okay, so um, when I first came for today's uh, class, I had another set of uh, chapters in mind, but then I just felt that maybe we should touch upon these things. So uh, sorry, I do not have all my Bible references in place, uh, but I thought that these are some things that we should uh, look at. So I hope it has been helpful to you. Anybody has any questions? Otherwise, we can actually close with the word of prayer. All right. Let's just close with the word of prayer. Okay, someone has a doubt. Sorry. I do not know. 
okay, just a question from a student asking whether the age of death mentioned uh, here in second case, where you have the uh, NP camp you know, completely being wiped out uh, in the you know, chapter which we just read a little while ago. So is that age of death the same as the one who did the attack uh, in Egypt? Is it the same or not? I do not know my idea of this. Uh, it does not specify whether the same age was used in both the occasions or whether it was someone else. Okay, let's close the bottom there. Lord, we just thank you so much for um, the lessons that we can learn from the lives of these kings. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be genuine uh, in our work with you. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be like Hezekiah, who was dependent on you and trusted you in his early days. But we pray, O oh Lord, that we would never grow overconfident and that we would continue to always seek your guidance, O Lord. And the second uh, very important thing, please, Lord, help us to be genuine in our intentions. So that, it is, uh, so that when we make a change, uh, it will be a permanent one and we show it in the way we follow you, in the way we serve you after that decision. So I pray, O oh Lord, that you can help us to have these qualities in our own lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for uh, participating in the class. And uh, you know, most more in the chronicles next week.